Hello everybody and welcome to another video in RunGB uh, Plane Analysis. Today we are going to take a look at the F4U1C, level 12 American fighter and <laughs> one of the former uh, planes of the of the path, so to speak. Um, this plane and overall all the F4Us were mm, really broken to a very weird point back in 1.31 um, they had uh, too much uh, clean rate and they didn't lose energy as they should and as a result well you could see a lot of them in battle of course back then I didn't fly it at all because uh, well there's no challenge in flying planes that aren't properly modeled um, but right now well after 1.33 hit the streets this plane was fixed and in the parts of uh, the flight model we, which were broken or at least most broken were brought to a reasonable level so the plane no longer climbs like a rocket and no longer keeps energy like if it had an anti g device strapped up the mat so yeah right now it's a very powerful plane but it's no longer broken and yeah it's very powerful really it is this plane historically was an, ad um, an ad adaptation of the F4U1A um, which usually had 650 guns to carry four 20mm machine guns uh, 20mm cannons, sorry um, the uh, change of um, um, weaponry was based mostly because of the kamikaze threat from Japan um, very hard hitting weapons that killed enemies in very few hits were needed because uh, kamikaze have to be brought down very very fast uh, very few of these were built actually less than 200 and they saw uh, combat over Okinawa um, they were generally disliked by the pilots who were used to the 50 cars and not to the 20mm it didn't help that the 20mm weren't properly adapted to the plane they tended to jam and all that jazz but that in the game currently of course is not happening um, so the plane overall is like an F4U the one you have been flying since uh, level 8 uh, because it's like an F4U1D in performance but with 20mm cans and of course this is a very powerful combo um, the plane is exceptionally good but it's often mis misunderstood in many ways I'm going to enter into that in a second it's got very heavy firepower it's a very fast plane not as fast as the Tempest actually if you have seen the plane analysis of the Tempest Mark V which I did a couple of days ago um, this plane flies very similar to the Tempest, but it's not as fast, doesn't climb as good, um, doesn't have as good weapons. They are almost as good, but they are not as good. In any case, these are rocket launchers, basically. These things really obliterate enemies in no time, so no big worries about that. But the way to fly in it is very similar. It's a fast plane that dives and zooms very, very well. Um, the reason why these uh, wings are this shape, which is often overlooked, is that uh, you can see the propeller is pretty big, and um, both the the builder of this plane, the designers, um, have to design the wing so the undercarriage could be as short as possible to be as strong as possible, and the way to do it was to put the wing in a ghoul disposition so the attachment of the wheels could be at the lowest point and so giving a lot of ground clearance for the propeller while not messing a lot the location of the wing this is one of the most characteristic planes of World War II because this wing shape is it has something this this is a plane I love this is probably my second favorite planes of um, history not exactly this version the corsair overall and i don't know why but that cool wing has a lot to do with that the thing is that without just by accident because it happened by accident uh but discovered that this particular way of shaping the wing into the fuselage at exact perfect right angles reduced drag a lot and that was huge this plane it's very powerful, has a very powerful engine, and it's very clean aerodynamically. And it's also very heavy. It's a heavy plane 
with very clean aerodynamics and a powerful engine. Boom and Summer Dream, and also very powerful weapons. So yeah, it's a Boom and Summer Dream. Now the part about the misunderstanding of this plane. The F4U, the Corsair, has a rep, a reputation, for being able to outturn German planes. As if that was something very big. I mean, German planes aren't designed to turn, so most things do. Yes, this plane outturns most German fighters. Um, even it's able to outturn a uh, BF109F using flaps with with uh, caution. It's perfectly able to, able to do so. But that doesn't turn this plane into a turn fighter. It has a good reserve ability to turn, but it's not a turn fighter. It's a boom and zoomer. Always remember it. Why is not a turn fighter? Because once it's slow, this plane struggles to regain speed. It doesn't accelerate well. It doesn't uh, climb very well. So you want to keep your energy up as much as you can. And while turning can be done by this plane, it can be done against German planes, not against Japanese ones, which are currently, everyone regards them as OP. Uh, out of the N1K, I don't really believe it. I mean, the Zero turns very well, but it's no OP, but besides the point. If you start turning with this plane, you are going to handle it badly. You have to keep yourself in boom and zoom. You have to fly this exactly as you would fly a P-47 or a P-51. It's a constant trend in the American planes. You have to fly them as boom and zoomers because that's what they are. Even while they can turn, some of them, like this one, can. Um, as I told you, it's not a good climber. It's not a good accelerator, but it's very, very quick. It's a very fast plane. Down low, on the deck, uh, at very low altitudes, is a very fast plane, one of the fastest of its level and immediately above. This actually, um, Doras struggle to catch up with, with this plane. They will do so in due time, but given a head start, it's very hard to catch a Corsair at full steam. Mm, more things about this plane, uh, flaps. Because this was a carrier borne aircraft, it had to have very huge wings, you can see they are enormous, uh, to generate as much lift as possible. As a result, um, the plane had pretty good um, low speed turning ca capabilities. That's why people regard it as a turner, even while it's not one. Another thing that they included was flaps, very effective ones. Combat flaps in the F4U generate a lot of lift for a very minor exchange in drag. Comparatively, of course, you don't want to keep your turn turn flaps up all the time. But on average, you want to use them more than what you use them in other planes because really they are very effective to close up very narrow um, maneuvers or to maneuver at very slow speeds, maybe at the top of a hammerhead or at a, a vertical reversal. And finally, the cannons. You can see. They ha it has four cannons, AN, M2, these are exactly the same as the Mark II British cannons, exactly the same, with 924 rounds, that's a lot, this plane has ammo to spare and to bore everyone around, you can fire a lot with these uh, weapons, and just one loadout with this, I mean just one flyout without coming back to reload, will warrant you the ability to kill four, five, six enemies without a problem. I have seen absolute carnages done by this plane back in 1.31 when it was utterly broken, but still it can do them because these weapons are one hit wonders. Really, they shred things on, on, on contact. And you're about to see that because, well, you're going to see a gameplay of, of, this, of this plane that pretty much portray what these weapons can do. The thing about this plane is that it can't load any kind of air to ground ordinance. I don't think that's bad. On the opposite, I think it's good. That means that no one will ever mismanage this plane like they a lot of people do with it. Other Corsairs that can take rockets or bombs. Um, so no big deal. <laughs> Finally, the repair cost is um, thirty-one thousand seven hundred lions in oh sorry, in historical battles, and oh shit. And uh, what it is, what it is, what it is, what it is, oh, sorry. And in arcade battles, it's of course much cheaper. 
and it goes by almost 7,000 lions, which is not a huge lot. Um, this plane is expensive in historical battles, um, but rightly so, it's very powerful. Um, I will rate this as um, almost an equal to the Dora. Uh, the Dora climbs better, uh, accelerates better, but in pure boom and zoom is almost as good as this one. Um, the thing is that if you compare this with the Tempest, the other plane I analyzed it a couple of days ago, the Tempest had a very huge problem with roll rate this plane doesn't have. This plane rolls very, very, very exceptionally well at high speeds. Maybe the problem with this plane is that it rolls too fast for its own good because one thing is roll rate, another is roll inertia. Inertia means that um, how much um, force you have to exert to stop yourself from rolling or to start rolling. This plane has a very good roll rate, but has, has pretty high roll inertia because of the very large wings it has. So sometimes rolling so fast is even a little bit unwelcome because you are rolling maybe a bit too much. But even so, um, this plane handles like a dream at high speeds. It's, it's tough. I mean, this plane in dives and zoom and very high speeds really feels at home. So fly it fast, fly it quick, fly it in the vertical, boom, and zoom with it, and just blast opposition around. And yeah, enough of talking and enough of chatting. Let's see some action. And here we are, uh, we are in Guadalcanal going against Japanese uh, planes. And uh, well, Game start, we see a lower bomber and we don't go for it. Uh, why? Well, this is a very, very powerful um, bomber killer with these weapons, but you want to keep your altitude as much as you can because after the bombers come the fighters. And there you go, there's one there, A6M5. Speedfires going for them uh, because, well, there are more. Two exit. Well, uh, there are more. There are a lot. They have all climbed to an altitude, and we are about to cross with them. Look at that! That's the legion of the zeros. <laughs> That's the invasion of the A6Ms. <laughs> a lot of A6M3s, M6M5s, one A6M2, and most of them are higher than our team. So we have to be careful here. Keeping an eye on the one that might be coming for me which is this one, and yeah, it's coming for me. So what I'm going to do? Dive away. Standard against Japanese zeros. Um, dive away over 500 kilometers per hour and then zoom away. It's simple as that, because the zero can't maneuver at high speeds. Uh, it will break apart. So yeah, we are zooming. And now we are building our time. We are not going very aggressive. Remember, Boom Assume is all about timing, all about patience. Picking the proper enemy to kill and bounce it at the proper time. If you commit too soon, if you overcommit, you are going to die. So here we have an A6M5, which is maneuvering. And which we are going to destroy. He didn't see us coming. I'm using the stealth, by the way. And uh, yeah, a few hits and was enough to bring that down. These weapons really hit very, very, very hard. So vertical reversal. We want to keep our altitude as high as possible. Wow, look at that. Even more A6M and even higher. So we want to keep our altitude high. We don't want to commit our plane to kill just another one. We want to be fast. We want to be high. We want to be careful with um, what we do. We call the six of a Spitfire because I don't know if this guy has seen that um, zero, which is going for him. Always taking a look around, being sure that nothing will um, surprise us. Very important because you never want to be sort of jumped by surprise. Mostly because if you are surprised, it is the last time, the last thing you are going to experience in a given game. Um, so you can see here, I'm going very, very quick. I'm going at 420 kilometers per hour at 4,000 meters. That's very fast. Um, and now I'm going to zoom into the way of the A6M. I don't think I have enough speed to uh, catch him, but he's moving down. So I try to hit him. No luck. Reverse, go down on him. 
Mostly to try to clear that Spitfire. Keep a uh, track on what's around us. We don't want again to be surprised. Zero has broken from the Spitfire. Uh, not a good shot. I still tried, but oh look! I was think uh, what I was saying about not being jumped and not being surprised. Well, I just was. So what we do here? Well, first of all, we were very fast, and that's important. Always be fast in this plane. And the second thing we do is to point the nose down and just go at 700 km per hour, pull up at 12 Gs, and the zeros simply can't follow that. He's still on our track, so what we are going to do is a repeat of that. He's coming for us, dive away, there's no way in hell he's going to catch up. 720 km indicated, level up, never ever gonna catch up with us. So we keep on going for a while, start zooming, and there you go, he's unable to catch up. He's just so slow now, because the zero doesn't dive or zoom like an F for you. Um, question has been raised a lot of times about how do I handle N1 case with care because they are broken. <laughs> but it's basically doing the same because even the N1K doesn't dive and zoom as well as a Corsair, but it does it really well. So the margin of error is much, 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 much mm, closer. You really have to fly to your strengths and don't have a single mistake because otherwise the N1K will, will kill you. It's, it's really very, very broken. One of the things about the Corsair, overheat the oil if you abuse the uh, web a lot. You saw there I had to throttle back for a while because I was overheating. Be always mindful of your low and right screen and your temperature readings because if you let it overheat for more than 30 seconds this, he, this thing will lose its engine in less than one, than one minute. And there's no way around that. Once the engine starts getting damaged because of overheating, nothing will stop that. And uh, you will lose your engine in no time. So be very careful with that. Uh, in hot maps like this or Sicily, it's a problem. In um, cold maps like um, Bolts, for, for instance, is not such a big deal. But always keep an eye on, on that heat overheating just in case. At the zero, we totally missed that one. That was a bad lead shot. I don't follow, I don't overcommit, I keep on going. I have achieved what I wanted, which was uh, distract that A6M from the Spitfire, he was trailing. I have cleared his 6, but now the Spitfire is going up for him. So, yep, time to reverse. Of course, always in the vertical, to keep as much energy as possible. And now, let's see if we can back that guy. The Spitfire is doing it totally wrong. He's <laughs> he's doing all the things a Spitfire never should do versus an A6M. He's actually t trying to outturn the Zero. Uh, well, he's lucky because I'm here. Got a critical. But surprisingly, I didn't kill him. That was a very powerful burst, but no, he's not dead yet. So what I'm going to do is to go down and try to execute here. him. Still, we achieved to, to clear that Spitfire 6. This was a very important thing to do. I mean, the more uh, friendlies that we have, the better. Even while they are Spitfires that try to uh, outturn a zero. But luck in this shot, I should have got some hits, but... Well, it happens. And now we come close behind him. And totally mess up <laughs> the approach. This is what happens. This is what I was telling you about roll rate. I actually rolled it a way bit too much to uh, deal the killing blow and I didn't notice until it was too too late. So well, all I have to do is to level up and keep on going because he's never going to catch up. He's much, much, much lower on energy. So yep, he's slower. I'm waiting for him to break away and I'll return towards him. There you go, it's already maneuvering, so it's time to return and to deal with him. But that kind of thing um, happens a lot. This plane rolls so well that sometimes you over-roll, because it doesn't stop in time. He has a very big w uh, roll in inertia, and you have to be careful with that, of course. So, yeah. 
let's go for that guy and finish him off because it's about time. I mean, he's been smoking for half an hour now and it's about time to, to, to stop him suffering. So there you go, yet another critical. He's lost control, he's going down. Yeah, no reason to follow him because he's going to grass. And kill. Checking his scores and oh shit! We have three fighters, we have a bomber and one other fighter. No, we don't have any other fighter yet. So yeah, if you are wondering what's that around on the on the text box, is that at the game start there was a little bit of debate ongoing if I was the real whether if I was the real run GB or not. I was saying hey, oh hi and all that stuff and yeah well yes I am Ryan JB but people were adopting it so yeah a little bit of fun about that for being a faker I'm doing pretty well <laughs> anyway I'm the one the only one fighter here we have a bomber left and they have um, superiority in fighters and I'm going to have to protect that bomber. But now what I'm doing is to build a little bit of speed and check scores again to ensure that, yeah, they have two zeros a key and a KI-45. And we are only one bomber and one fighter, so we are in a severe disadvantage here. The A6M is coming for the bomber, but the bomber deals really well with him. Uh, sets him on fire, critical damage. And I'm watching here just in case that guy, yeah, the fire went out. I don't know what's with zeros lately that they don't burn as well as they should. So, well, time to set up the attack. And clear that poor B25-6. Uh, because otherwise it's going to get molded. The zero spot us, spots us. We can't follow the breakdown, so we don't try. Zoom away. And begin the vertical dance. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? Steep in the angle. Pure vertical movement. And bring the nose down when the speed is low enough. And that way we ensure we have a second run on him. Pointing us towards him. He's emitted, so I mean but all that I'm seeing is that he has a damaged engine. But seems that the control surfaces are not damaged. I missed this shot. Mm, wasn't an easy one anyway, so yeah. And some back. And keep on dancing. This time he's not coming vertical, or is he? Double check. Yeah, he's trying to come for us, but he can't because he's very slow. So nose down again and set another pass. And whoa, what was that? What was that? Oh, we have a visitor here, ki 45 I have to deal with this guy. How do I do it? Diving away. I'm going to dive away. Try my luck. No deal. I don't have a shot with this guy and I'm going to keep on going. Level up. At very low altitude. And start zooming away. And that guy is toast. Simply can't follow. By the way, oil overheat again. I spot it. So I quit, I quit using web and I start going at 100% to cool down a little bit. I would actually cut down to 90%, but I'm in the middle of a zoom and I don't want to go engine because that guy may catch up with me at the top. But, well, you know what's coming. It's... As the agent um, said to Neo, it's inevitable. You feel it coming. It's destiny. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to totally destroy that guy. Boom, there he goes. And now it's time to deal with that last uh, A6M. I don't know what happened with the other one. There were two A6Ms and one ki 45 but the other one is nowhere to be found. Maybe he crashed, trying to land, who knows. 
Again, being careful, Ooh, oil overheat cool down to 90%, let the engine cool down a bit until the message disappears. There he is, A6M3. So let's go for him. We don't have uh, any overheating anymore, so soon we will go to one emergency power again. Actually, I'm going to 100. I don't want to overheat now. If I have to overheat, I'd rather do it later. <laughs> but right now I have the advantage. I don't really have to force my engine. Now I do, because he's coming directly for me. He's coming straight, straight back. And I want to hook him. So instead of going purely vertical, I'm doing it in steps, step by step. And now we are purely vertical. He's never going to catch up with us. And again, you know what's coming. It's inevitable. It's the sound of the inevitable happening. Nose down, hammer complete. And just finally, just cool his misery and stop. I mean, this guy was on fire maybe five minutes ago. It's about time he dies. There you go. One hit. Elevator critical. Uh, he's going down. And yep, yeah, that's it for this battle. That's it. Four kills with not the best of situations, especially at the middle of the battle and at the end. At the middle of the battle, we had a lot of enemy high zeros that were surprising me all the time. So, yeah, still, very effective plane. You can't deny the results of this plane. You can. You can't argue with four kills against zeros. So yeah, very, very, very good plane. And that's firepower. Oh, 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 really amazing firepower. So let, okay, let's see the results and go to the conclusions. The thing is, this plane, um, now everyone is saying that it's, it has been nerfed to hell. It has not been nerfed, it has been fixed. It was so broken, it was a pain in the ass. Um, the thing is, the perspective of people. People are thinking in, in the same, um, with the same point of view of World of Tanks, for instance. Boof or nerf. There's no boofing or nerfing in War Thunder. There's fixing. If something is underperforming, it will be, quotes, buffed. If something is overperforming, it will be, quotes again, nerfed. This plane wasn't nerfed. This plane was fixed. And it's exceedingly powerful. It's one of, it's very fun to fly as well. I mean, well, if you like Boom Assume, I do. Maybe if you don't, it's not as, as um, fun. But if you are flying American stuff, you should like Boom and Zoom because American planes are all about Boom and Zoom. So, yeah, really, this plane is very fun to fly, it's very effective, has demolition weapons, very fast, exceptional at what it does. Even after the, quote, nerf, <laughs> or rather, fix. So, yeah, that's it for today's review. I hope you liked it, I hope you had fun watching it. Uh, and as always, guys, uh, thank you very much for watching, and see you later.